How long can Hollywood hold out? It's the biggest industry shutdown in over 60 years, with 170,000 actors and writers on strike. They want higher pay and tighter regulations on AI. But are their demands fair? And where could a compromise be made? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the Hollywood strike. A-listers have been out on the picket lines for several weeks now, joining thousands of lesser-known actors and writers with a list of demands for big studio bosses. Multiple unions have joined forces in an effort to be heard. They want to negotiate terms with the studios, particularly around residual payments for films and series on giant streaming platforms. They also want the use of AI to be better regulated. Here's a look. It should have been a glamorous summer in Hollywood. Barbie mania is taking over the world. Christopher Nolan's highly anticipated film Oppenheimer has hit theaters and the Mission Impossible franchise has returned with its seventh movie. But while these are playing, the industry is shutting down. Earlier this month, actors joined screenwriters in Hollywood's first joint strike in over six decades. We are the victims here. We are being victimized by a very greedy entity. I am shocked by the way the people that we have been in business with are treating us. I cannot believe it, quite frankly. Corporate greed is acceptable. Wages have shrunk over the years. Many have second jobs and hardly make ends meet. So they're demanding a pay rise and higher pension and health care contribution caps. We're, we're fighting for all of us to um, be able to, you know, pay our rent, feed our kids, um, you know, send our kids to college, uh, you know, have, have a, a, a decent um, and, and dignified uh, income and, and living. Celebrities make up a very small portion of the Screen Actors Guild membership. In fact, there was a statistic released recently that over 80% of its members do not qualify for health care. Residuals that actors get paid when their performance is reused is an important part of their income. Yet the rise of streaming has significantly diminished that. Actors have posted their residual checks on social media to show how drastic the situation is. And they are asking streaming platforms to pay according to viewership levels, but the company have refused to share the ratings. I think, I think it's time. It's, it's been how long since uh, we've been treated with respect since streaming started happening? I mean, residuals are coming in at like $2 a, a paycheck, and it's just ridiculous. The companies say they've offered historic pay and residual increases, but that unions have chosen a path that will lead to financial hardship for countless thousands of people. Disney CEO Bob Iger calls the actors' demands unrealistic, while Netflix executives say they're committed to reach an agreement as soon as possible. Union was very much a part of our lives when I was growing up. Uh, and I also remember on more than one occasion uh, my dad being out on strike. And I remember that because it takes an enormous toll on your family, uh, financially and emotionally. So you should know that nobody here, uh, nobody within the AMPTP, and I'm sure nobody at SAG or nobody at the WGA took any of this lightly. Another major sticking point is artificial intelligence. Writers are worried that AI tools used to produce scripts and stories could drive them out of the job. And the Actors Union spokesperson said the studios proposed to scan background actors and use their images in further projects without any compensation or consent. If we don't stop this now, this maniacal need to make money over allowing people to make a living uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's going to be a dystopia. Actors and writers are determined to keep striking, and their struggle might fundamentally change the business at the Dream Factory. So when might we see our showbiz favorites get back to work, and will writers and actors get the deal they deserve? Joining me now to debate that are from Washington, William W. Beach. He's the head of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. From London, Stephanie Tachi is an entertainment journalist. And from St. Louis, Matthew Bodie is a professor of law at the University 
of Minnesota. Thanks all so much for being with me. William, let me start with you. Give sure. us a better idea of just how big this industry really is and how many people are being affected by it. Because, you know, being TV, we naturally focus on kind of the big names involved. But there's a huge domino effect here, too, is there not? Absolutely. I mean, uh, if you say big, well, Netflix is pretty big for me. Uh, and it, that, that will definitely be affected by this. But let me just give you some numbers, some proportions. There are about 2 million people in the sector of the labor force, which we call arts and entertainment. But of those, I'm looking at some data now, about 54,000 of those are actors. And but they're actors all over the United States. Not all of them are in Hollywood, but most of them are in that Hollywood or Atlanta area where a lot of this work is done. You've got about 154,000 directors and producers. It's amazing how many more of that than you have of actors, but they include assistant directors and assistant producers, of which there are many, many more. And then of the writers, which really started the strike, they're the, they're the ones who are really out on strike right, right, right now. Yeah. Uh, the writers are an, another 54,000. I guess if you remember 54,000. But then that's not all. You've got people who are in the what called the drayage business, transportation business, the handlers. The Teamsters, for example, handle all the horses and snakes and lions and tigers that you see on, mm -hmm. on these programs. Um, and then it goes on and on beyond that to people in the... Um, uh, the business of supplying food and yeah. and, uh, the, and just all of that. So so my guess is that this could become a pretty big strike if the Teamsters and others then agree to honor the picket lines. Okay. Now, having, having heard those numbers, Matthew Bodie, you know, industry mm -hmm. bosses have said that they think the actors and writers are actually being selfish by putting so many people out of, out of work through their uh, complaints, really. Is, I mean, is there mm -hmm. any justification to that studio boss perspective? I don't think so. I think what you're seeing here is really some remarkable solidarity. Um, the, the local Teamsters uh, president uh, in LA gave a really stirring speech um, when the Writers Guild strike started. Um, and there's been a lot of, I think, understanding that um, if one union is hurt, um, that's going to affect the other unions uh, negatively as well. So I think um, there was some concern that whether um, the actors might strike a, a deal, um, which would have put a lot more pressure on the writers. I should say there's concern amongst the writers <laughs> that that would happen. But um, the, the actors have now gone on strike. Um, and I think uh, you've, you've seen a lot of willingness of the other unions. Uh, and it's a very unionized industry. Uh, certainly compared to most industries in the United States. So I, I think the understanding is that we could be at an inflection point. Um, and uh, the way Hollywood does business could really change if the um, unions are unable to reach the type of agreements that they'd be interested in getting. Uh, and if and therefore, I think there's some sense of, of working together on this. So the industry is on the precipice of change, you think, but for, for better or for worse? Well, I think it depends, and it depends on your perspective, uh, right? Uh, I think some of what you're seeing from some of the negotiating points that have leaked um, from the AMPTP uh, uh, think that there's just too much kind of old, outdated, uh, you know, required staffing, uh, residuals, um, uh, an unwillingness to adopt AI, uh, an unwillingness to allow name, image, and likeness to be used in, in ways that couldn't be used before uh, because the technology has gotten so much better. Um, on the other hand, if you look at it from the writers and the actors um, and, you know, perhaps um, from all those folks involved in the transportation as well, they, they, the, the possibilities are getting much worse, right? It's kind of a dystopian future where you know, your image could be taken by the studio if you're an actor and used in countless projects uh, yeah. and you get a pittance of what you might have gotten before. I want to talk further about that AI in just a second. But let me let me go to Stephanie, yeah. because, you know, the major kind of players now are these streaming services, only one of which is is truly profitable right now. And that's actually Netflix. So do streaming services only make profits on subscriptions because if they do it's difficult for you know content creators to demand more profit share according to views mm -hmm. that they would get because it's all kind of shared equally in the end according to these streaming services well 
think of it as a myth because you know when you think of Amazon, you think of Netflix, you think of Apple. They are million dollar industries where they've made a lot of money from content creators. But what's happening now is a lot of, as we saw with Netflix, Netflix was forced to lower down its subscription prices because it was losing subscribers. So if they don't have enough pull for the subscribers, it means it has a knock on effect on the amount it can pay its content providers and the people who are working on all these productions. But it goes hand in hand, you know, in order to pull these subscribers in to make these companies the sub Success they are, they need to be producing the content. So at the moment, these subscribe these streamers are going to be facing really difficult conversations at the moment because if you've got a lot of productions which have been put on hold due to these strikes, yeah. how can they be in more subscribers. So that's why, for me, I found it very hard to understand why these streamers have not been working hard with these content providers, with the actors, with the whole industry in general, to kind of compromise with them on what they may need to put these strikes to an end. Because what's happening now, we're looking at a lot of productions which have just stopped and potentially might not get picked up till maybe the end of the year, unless a deal is struck. What I've heard argued, though, yeah. is that these streaming services actually give smaller creators a chance to kind of avoid the big studios that wouldn't have let them in. So, like I said, it's almost like profit sharing. You know, the big movies and series lead to more subscriptions, and that money is spent on lesser-known, you know, documentary makers and less, big, mm -hmm. fewer big-name yep. productions. I think that's what people have been grateful for in terms of streamers, that they have provided this platform for new talent to expose their work. But now what's happening is the news becoming the old, and then you need to think, how does it become profitable? You can have your work out there, but then how do you sustain? How do you money and now we've had this introduction of AI into the industry, stuff that which hasn't been factored in. Mm, okay. William, go ahead uh, with, with your analysis of, of the question I just put to, to Stephanie. Well, I, I just want, yeah, I, I just want to build on what my two colleagues have said. I think it's really important, those, those points. This, uh, in the end, right now, and with the issues in front of us, this is all about streaming. Uh, I mean, AI is there, but it is an issue which they'll get to. But the real, they have to get past the streaming issue. And the internet has disrupted every industry in which it has penetrated and here's a major disruptive effect it's been happening over many years building over many years and the industry has simply not ever gotten it right they don't have the right structure they don't have the right compensation packages the you know the element after element that's crucial to the development of content has been has been sidelined as the industry has not engaged with the writers and the actors and, and and all of the support materials you have to get the streaming issue right and that's why that's why it is a turning point for the for this industry tv broadcast is dying the movies are holding on by their fingernails the the, the future is in streaming and if you don't get the streaming right then the industry has a very bumpy okay future william indeed. Let, i mean it, it, let me put this to you and ask you if it reminds you at all of when music was actually first digitized and, and became Absol available absolutely. on the internet. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in the end, yeah, if absolutely. it sounds like what's happening today uh, with, you know, actors and, for example, their fear of AI, will it end the same? Because eventually the technology had to be integrated. And I guess for better or for worse, you know, streaming platforms and music had to find a way to compensate creators yeah. again. Has it, it worked out, it and could it not just work out the same for actors and writers when it comes to integrating technology yeah, this, now? This is just my opinion, which mm. doesn't doesn't actually count for very much. But, but I think what's happening is that the <clears throat> motion picture industry is trying to impose on streaming the very model of production which they had in the old days, and with changes, true, with with changes. But they're basically trying to impose that. I would guess the future will be the structure will be very different. I wouldn't be surprised to see writers and uh, actors owning streaming services and, and actually getting a large amount of revenue through ownership as through wages. Look, look at these wages. The average wage for a, an actor is seventeen dollars and ninety four cents. People think actors make these huge amounts of money, but if you're right in the middle, you're making seventeen dollars. And and if you're in the top ten percent of all compensated actors right now, we're not talking about writers or any producers, just actors. Your your wage is one hundred and nine dollars. 
So this is not yeah. an industry in which there are huge amount of packages, but it has to be ultimately better compensation has to be there. Yeah. Okay. It's all about uh, that. But Matthew, I mean, going back to, you know, it, it, comparisons with the music industry having to deal with, with online streaming. And, you know, you, you'll remember there was a huge uproar among musicians saying that our intellectual property, our art is being stolen and given away for free by organizations at the time. It was Napster was the founder of the, this, you know, this movement. Eventually, like I said, that technology was integrated and then monetized in a fairer way. Is it just a matter of time, maybe, before Hollywood catches up with that same model that the music industry had to deal with? You know, I, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know that it is a matter of time because, again, a lot of the, the decisions that are made early in the process have real ramifications going forward. Um, you know, if the writers had not organized in the 1930s at the beginning of film, right, uh, I, I think you could see a very different process for writing on a film, right? Uh, you could see see a process where writers were not given residuals, where writers were not given required staffing um, uh, at, for a particular project. So uh, I, I think there is a lot of money to go around and there is a lot of money for talented people, right? And so to some extent, right, uh, you're very uh, high level, very talented, very well-known actors, um, the writers that have shown an ability to bring projects to the screen that are successful, uh, there will be a demand for those and those people will do well in the, in the market. But I think part of what the writers are saying and the actors are saying is that um, if you change the model, you are going to, uh, essentially, you're going to kill the goose that, you know, brought us to this point and, and keeps laying the golden eggs. Mm. Um, and you might end up with uh, an industry that is not as successful, right? Um, and one thing we are seeing with things, uh, with streamers like Netflix, is kind of the expansion beyond the United States. That's great for a lot of international producers, and like you said, documentarians and, and a lot of places, including the United States, but all over the world, uh, right? But um, what Hollywood wants to see is a system that makes sure um, it has a, as a broader reach as, as it possibly can. Um, and what the writers are looking for and the actors are looking for is a way to make sure to have the legal rights that they will have control and they will have, you know, ongoing revenue streams themselves from these projects. Right. It's it's a bit frightening, though. I mean, they, we keep hearing the word dystopia mentioned by, especially by Fran Drescher, because we've had this endless discussion about AI, period, and how people don't understand how it's going to work exactly. I mean, even its creators are saying it, it has huge potential dangers. I mean, Stephanie, in your opinion, though, from what you've seen and what the, the unions have been describing, who should worry more about AI, actors or writers? Because even without AI, writers, I would think, have a very difficult time showing their work has been appropriated. Actors at least can say, hey, that's my image. You recreated it. You didn't pay me for it. But do you think the writers and the actors are at the same risk here? No, because I think with actors, they have more control, as you said, over their image and whatever they agree to, they actually have a lot more power at the moment. I know at the moment there's been discussions on what is going to be acceptable in terms of actors being used in the future as AI, you know, whether an actor's died or whether it can be repeated and repeated. Scenes. But at the moment, like software such as ChatGPT, it's not sophisticated enough to be delivering flawless Hollywood scripts. But that's at the moment. And I think give it a couple of months or even a few years, it will be ready where it can be mm -hmm. polishing Hollywood scripts and doing entire films. So writers have every right now to be feeling very fearful for their jobs because they can become redundant. And a lot of, as with these streamers are facing a lot of challenges in terms of getting subscribers, what they can do is they can just get rid of having to pay for a writer and having a script being done by an AI, which will be much cheaper, much faster. But one thing that you cannot get with AI, and which is why I will always be passionate about having people doing their jobs is the creativity. You cannot have the mind of a Hollywood writer or someone who's written a whole production or a TV show. That cannot easily be replaced. You can have the production that can be done, but having someone's input is very much needed. So it's kind of very disrespectful that these streamers are feeling that 
can just, you know, disregard or diminish the jobs that these writers do, and including the actors as well. It's interesting, though, yeah, because well, I... people think, yeah, you can't, you can't recreate that creativity. You can't recreate the human mind, but that's exactly what AI is supposed to be doing, and it's getting better and better at it. We have issues as journalists, you know, wondering if we're going to have, yeah, especially print yeah, journalists. Right. Are we going to have our jobs? Do we need to start looking at? Uh, William, I'll, I'll ask you that. I mean, do, does how many yeah. creative and intellectual industries need to start thinking about preparing con contracts now in anticipation of what AI might threaten them with? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to take another position because I don't agree with this threat analysis. Uh, uh, yes, it threatens everything, but it's a disruptive technology. That's that's by its nature. Disruptive technologies threaten everything. What's going to happen here, I think, is that you'll see AI create massive amounts of competition with Hollywood. You'll have uh, studios spring up all over the world. You'll, it, 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 it hugely reduces the cost of startup, of entry, of the propagation of materials. My guess is that the biggest threat right now of AI is not to actors, not to writers, but is to the owners of the studios. Uh, they think they can use it, and they can, they, and they will. Uh, writers and actors will, will push back, and there'll be parameters put on that. But I think the biggest overall threat, 10 years from now, I'm making a prediction right now, mm -hmm. Hollywood is 50% what it, what it is right now, and uh, there's this mm -hmm. AI has just exploded creative uh, capacity all around the, around the world in places we cannot even imagine right now. Uh, Stephanie, well, do, go ahead. William, sorry, William, I do have to ask, what is the limit, though, with AI? I think this is why it's so scary for a lot of industries. I think, yeah, it can yeah. help benefit these industries, but it just seems like there's no limit. And I think that's why a lot of people Probably are right. getting scared. There's nothing in right. place to almost guard it, safeguard it in that sense. So it, it, it can't rampage across property rights. It can't rampage across my person. Uh, I have a court system. I have a legal system almost all around, around the world. There are ways in which I could I can sue the pants off somebody who's trying to steal uh, my assets. And AI is going to challenge that. It, 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 this is disruptive. It is not safe. But we're going to have to work through it. And I'm, and I'm saying that if we let AI go forward, but we also use property rights, the, the courts, the unions to push back against the excesses of it. It will. We can channel it in a way that it will be as productive in the entertainment industry as it is currently being productive in automobiles, in in, mm. in manufacturing, in in accounting. It's it is it is making things so much more productive. But it will make more things productive here. If you think the world's going to be the same ten years from now, and you can just settle this with arbitration and labor dis disputes, forget it. This is this is a period of huge disruption and a, a turning point for this industry. If they don't get streaming right, if they don't get AI right, then, then you know, it's just, it's just going to be a different world out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, I'll, I'll come to you with one, one final question, because you talked about, you know, the potential for the, the industry kind of bosses to kill the goose that laid the golden egg by, you know, stifling the, the creators, the, the real, the, the actors, the writers, the, the fun, the core of entertainment. But they're arguing at the same time, you know, you're killing us because we just came back from COVID. You know, studios went into huge amounts of debt because we couldn't create for two years. And now here you are striking. Is, is there some truth to that as well, that, you know, this is an industry that's just barely making a comeback now? Well, if you look in the short term, uh, there has been huge disruption, uh, certainly to certain aspects of the industry, um, you know, the theater industry, um, the movie theater industry, uh, for example, um, still recovering. They had a great weekend uh, um, in the U.S. and I think abroad uh, just this past one. But um, for the most part, um, it has been huge shocks. Now, right, part of what the pandemic did, though, um, as William was alluding to, is streaming, right? Um, we got much more comfortable with streaming. We got much more um, uh, comfortable with getting all of our entertainment from streaming, you know, skipping the movie theater. Um, and, and the studios are still trying to figure that out. Uh, when it comes to movies, do they have simultaneous release dates? Uh, do they release in three weeks after uh, theaters or three months or, um, you know, some longer period of time? Right. Um, I, I think in terms of 
the industry that the industry is, has kind of always brought this on itself, right? Um, if you go back to the um, the writers' strike in the early two thousands. Um, you know, the, the company said, well, streaming, we don't really think much is going to happen with it. But, you know, we want the freedom to, to fool around with yeah. it. And you guys can't really impede on our freedom. The writers are like, no, we, we need to make sure we're not we're not cut out there. I'm I got to interrupt you there. I'm so sorry. We're actually over time uh, for this edition of the Newsmakers. But I'm sure we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about this at a, at a date in the near future because it's as it progresses. So thank you, all three of my panelists, so much for being with me and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.